Thank you, Dawn and choir. It is good to, to see you guys this morning. It's good to be back up here. I promise to stay a little longer this time. It's uh, a lot of good stuff going on in the life of our church. I want to say a big thank you to the folks who were here yesterday. They did a lot of the work on the cleanup. I don't know if you noticed when you came in that the trees trimmed up. and Yeah, lots of good work. Taking good care of God's house, and uh, that's important to us. We would thank you. Thank you for that. I'm also sensitive to the fact, how many of you guys enjoyed that extra hour of sleep this morning? Did anybody here want to confess to forgetting and showing up early? I see a hand over there. That's right. Uh, Chris said this is the morning that when people who uh, forget to set their clock, they show up at church and go, oh, our church has music. Uh, they're used to, if you get here a little early, you get a whole different flavor of things. But I'm also in touch with the fact that while your sleep schedule may be benefiting from an hour of extra sleep, that your stomachs are still on daylight savings time. Am I right? That's right. Well, let's take, uh, let's take encouragement from the great words of Lyle Lovett, who says, if the preacher preaches long enough, he'll get hungry too. And so... Uh, but if you'll hold out to the end of the sermon, I've got a little meal for you right there. And so we'll, uh, we'll hold on. Last week was one of those times that uh, you never want to have happen. Those of you who were not here, just be thankful. Uh, I just got sick. It came on me in a hurry, uh, just about to pass out right up here. You know, everybody has had that moment in your life. Uh, and you, you, you know it when, when you know that you're just irretrievably sick in that moment and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, just not all of y'all are so lucky to have had that moment on a stage in front of several hundred people. That's, that's something you just don't necessarily want to, uh, to have happen. But we, we've survived it. Phil did a great job. Big kudos to Phil. For jumping in, if you were here last week, you know that he actually, I'd left my notes up here, and he picked them up, and I use this form of, it's called mind mapping, it's like hieroglyphics, this little Z pattern thing that I use to kind of give me notes and things, and but he was channeling his inner Bob Seger, uh, he was working on mysteries without any clues, and, uh, <laughs> but he uh, managed to carry it through, and for that we are grateful. I uh, got out of here at home and, and got in bed and didn't get out for quite a while. It was uh, sometime early Sunday evening when Lisa snuck into the, the, the room. I was, was pretty much with chills and in bed and everything. And she asked me how I was doing. And I can vaguely remember that I said, Honey, I, I, see, I see a great white light. She said, Go for it. <laughs> not really, not really. That was a hallucination in that moment. But uh, we're glad to have that behind us, and we can press reset. And, and I'm going to run back to the, uh, the sermon that we had in play last week, and let's do a do-over. Because I think it still speaks to us, particularly in light of where we are as a church family and where we are in light of the table that stands before us. We're doing signs of progress. The title for this week is Resources for This Project Provided By... And let's take a look at the sign that lives just outside our church, out on uh, 275. We got this far last week to look at the Gandhi Boulevard improvements. How many of y'all are convinced that they are improvements? We're holding out hope. We're holding out hope. Uh, a couple of things to take note of there. One is the very idealized completion date of spring of 27. Uh, I, I think I'm more hopeful for Tuesday than I am for that. Uh, but then also the questions or comments and the phone number. I'd like everybody right now just to take out your phones. <laughs> Dial that number. Go ahead, let's do it. Now, and just when they answer, just say, come on, man. Just come on. We've been, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But we've been at this thing a while as we're looking at the projects and the uh, construction that keeps coming along, and we're, we're looking for the end of it, looking for uh, some conclusion that gives us hopefully a better world in which to live in, to drive in, to get around in, and uh, certainly a little less obstruction. 
But you notice there's a, there's a little word up there that says buy. Where does the funding for this come from? Where is the origination? Where are the resources for that? The whole idea that everything in life comes with a price is not a new development. That is true of road projects. It's true of your family's projects. It's true of our own lives because the scriptures tell us, do you not know that you are not your own? That you are bought with a price? Jesus fully understood that. And to that end, would you look with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 14. When he talks about the cost of being a disciple, Jesus is speaking here. And he gives us a teaching about our response to his response. What do we do in response to the one who gave his life for you and me that we might have life? Hear the words of the Lord. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and they were were turning uh, to them and, and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, and wife and children, his brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You can file that under things I wish Jesus hadn't said. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will... Send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but it loses its its saltiness. And how can it be made salty again? It's neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile, and it's, it's put out. Then as Jesus is apt to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now those are hard words and hard sayings directly from the mouth of Jesus. But I thought you might want to hear them again from the lips of a child that may help us at least hear them with a little quieter tenor. But the truth is still in there. And before we get done this morning, we're going to take some time and deal with it. Take a listen. Jesus told this parable in Luke 14. Anyone who does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Let's say some guy really wants to build a tower. Now you might be wondering, why would he want to build a tower? I mean, who wouldn't want to build their very own tower? Come on, right? I mean, don't you think this guy is going to sit down and see if he has all that he needs to finish it? Especially the cash. Because if he pours a foundation, builds the base, and constructs half of it, and then runs out of money and supplies, that would be dumb. And everyone would drive by this dude's tower and be like, Hey dummy, you know what you should have done before you built that tower? You should have counted out the cost before you even started. I hate it when people point out stuff that makes perfect sense. Or, what if a king was about to go to war with another king? Wouldn't he first sit down and figure out if his army of 10,000 could beat the other guy's army of 20,000? If not, the dude better sit that one out or he'd get owned. In the same way, any of us who don't count the cost and give up everything can't really be called a disciple of his. Jesus said salt is good, but if it doesn't taste like salt, then it's lost its worth. It wouldn't even be fit for the soil or a pile of manure. So he who has ears, listen up. Ha! Jesus just said poop. I like that. To really get the context of this text, you kind of have to know what's going on. You got to know what Jesus knew that evidently the others around did not. Jesus is 14 chapters into the book of Luke. He's, He's rolling along in his ministry. It's winding its way down. 
and he's moving towards Jerusalem. And he knows why he's going to Jerusalem. He knows that there's going to be, and in, in, in the not too distant future, there's going to be a coronation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, hailing the Messiah. But that that celebration is not going to last long. That the coronation turns into a crucifixion. Now, the crucifixion turns into a resurrection, but that's a long way off. And his disciples and the people around him are gathered around with evidently no sense of what's about to happen. It says here he was gathering a large crowd. And, you know, my experience is when you gather a large crowd, it's because they like what they're hearing. That you gather a large crowd is because they're hearing what they want to hear, and there is an appeal to that. But here we find the folks that are coming around on the heels of that. They're seeing a miracle here, a miracle there, and some teaching here, and there's promise of some uprising, and they begin to get their own aspirations mixed in with Jesus and wondering what's happening and, and where things are going. And, and Jesus kind of begins to back up and get a feel for, you know, I don't think these folks are totally getting the picture. They think it's all about what they can get, not about what they have to give. They think it's about all that you can acquire without thinking about what you have to do with that. They're worried about how they can ascend without understanding that all this comes at a great cost. Jesus fully understood that because he was on his way to pay that price. We talk about the price of construction. Never lose sight of the fact that our own souls come with a price. And that price was the life of Christ, that he came and he gave his life while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You never want to lose sight of that. That's why even here in this church, in a very unbaptist expression, when you walk into this church, you find out there a, a crucifix, All right, which reminds us that you never want to lose sight of the sacrifice. Now, you turn around in this room, and you see an empty cross behind you to remind you that Friday doesn't get the last word. But it doesn't make Friday any less real or any less necessary. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, and you might have it abundantly, but for you to have it, it's going to cost me mine. Now, against the backdrop of that, you've got a crowd kind of sur surfing around. They're saying, man, I, let me show up. I want to see some miracles. Maybe I'll get a miracle. I like this. They begin to get the idea that, hey, here's a great leader. Here's a, here's a ruler. Here's a rabbi. He's going to overthrow things. And it doesn't take long to figure out that they have assigned a political hope to a spiritual problem. Folks, Remember this, especially in light of everything going on around us right now. There never has been and there never will be a political answer to spiritual problems. The people here were looking at Jesus say, well, if we could just make you the king, if we could just make you the emperor, if we could just make you the head guy and put you in charge, everything's going to be great. And they didn't realize that Jesus was coming to do all of that, but not in a way that they had envisioned. I mean, if you listen carefully behind it, what you've got, you've got James and John back there. They're, they're, already, they're lobbying for cabinet positions. You know, I'll be the Secretary of State, and you can be the Secretary of Defense, and we'll, we'll get Judas over here and put him in charge of Treasury. Not a good idea. Um, you know, they're, they're already trying to figure all this stuff out as they're rolling along over here. And if you listen, you got Bartholomew back there saying, man, if we can just unite all these people, we're better together. And then there's Simon the Zealot going, let's make Israel great again. Y'all did catch that, didn't you? I don't, I don't want to feel like I wasted that one this morning. You see, we're not the first people to think that they're political answers to spiritual problems. But Jesus is saying the answer here is giving up to go up. The answer is being willing to pay the price. Then you get into those words that are deeply troublesome. If anyone's going to come after me, you've got, you've got to hate your family. 
Mama, dad, husband, wife, sister, brother, in comparison to the love you have for me, you hate. Now, let me go ahead and give you some good news this morning. Is that word hate literally means to uh, adamantly prefer over another. Okay? In other words, it's, it, it, that Jesus is, we prefer him and we give him preference over those other things in our life. Doesn't mean we get to hate our, our spouses. Doesn't mean we get to hate our family members in terms of being hateful because we know that God's very nature is love. But compared to the love that we share for Christ, the affection we have for even the most beloved among us would feel like hate. But the word here is actually a strong preference, a deferment. I will defer to the higher allegiance. And so we begin to do that and begin to understand that that grows out of having given all that we have in following of him. We oftentimes like to focus on what we get don't you? Do you remember what it's like to be a child on Christmas morning when you open up the presents? And you open one present and then you run to the next and you've already forgotten what's in one box when you look at the next because I want to get, I want to get. And Jesus is saying, life in me is the one thing that is so precious that it cost me everything. And if it's going to mean something to you, it'll cost you everything too. It's kind of like Chuck Swindoll and his telling of the story of the pearl of great price. You remember that parable. Where the guy sees the pearl as something he has to have. And he says, well, how much is this? And the vendor simply asks him, well, how much do you have? He said, well, I've, I've got a few hundred dollars in my checking account. And he says, well, that's mine. He said, well, uh, but if I give you all the money in my checking account, how will I pay my mortgage? And to which the vendor said, well, you, if you got a mortgage, you must have a house, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, that's mine too. And if you have a house and you have a mortgage, chances are you have a job. And yeah, I've got a job. Well, that's mine too. And if you've got a job, you've got some special abilities. You've got resources. You've got something that you can do that not everybody else can do or is willing to do. Yeah, I suppose that's mine too. By the way, in this house, of which you have a mortgage that's provided by your job, do, do you have a family? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, well, that's mine too. And then you begin to get the idea that everything is emptied out. By the way, does this job come with benefits? Do you have a 401k? Yeah, that's for my retirement. That's mine too. And then he says, but here's the deal. You keep all of that. And just remember where it came from. And remember who it belongs to. That we give all of ourselves to the one who gave all of himself for you and for me. That's what we call stewardship, which grows out of our discipleship. Understanding that everything, and I do mean everything that we have, is a gift that comes to us from God. And we respond to his son by what we do with it. Because you know, one day, God will ask every one of us, what did you do with everything I gave you? And the way you live now determines how you get to answer that question later. Now Jesus here, as he begins to teach this text, he, he gives you a couple of examples. But, but understanding that things don't come without a price. He, first of all, tells the story of building a tower. Well, again, we need a little context. Uh, when I think of building a tower, you know, I was driving up the other day in Tampa. As I was driving through on the left, there's a tower over there. Somebody tell me what that's for. It's a water tower. It's, it's just a big tower. It looks different than a water tower, but I see it over there. This, you go over to Claremont, there's a citrus tower. Well, understanding that towers back in those days were actually uh, part of the agricultural world, not just military world. That they would, they would go, so you could survey your fields, so you could look, you could tell if there were any varmints and critters that were coming in, attacking. You could actually see from a distance how, how everything was going. So a, a farmer uh, would build a tower in order to survey all that he had. But he said, count the cost before you start. The second analogy he used is that of a king going to war. Make sure that 
what you're going to war with will compete with what you're going to war against. And then if that's not going to work, be willing to go another way. But be really clear about the price that it takes. Y'all know that anything worth having in this life comes at a price. All right? You know, you think about it. You look at somebody who is in great, great physical shape. You know? That, that would not be me. But... You know, you find somebody like that. You kind of realize these are the people who get up and go and who exercise and work and do these things. That body didn't just happen by itself. It happened at price. Malcolm Gladwell in the book Outliers tells us that to become an expert in anything, you've got to be at it 10,000 hours. Think about that. If you're going to be an expert at something, 10,000 hours is the rule of thumb of how much time you've got to spend. So when somebody looks at somebody with a great ability and says, man, I wish I could do what you do, they could easily say back to you, but are you willing to do what I've done? Because we lose track of the fact that things do come with a price. Great marriages don't happen by accident. They don't happen by chance. They happen when we pour ourselves into it, when we're mindful of the times when we have failed, and when we're mindful of how we work towards the ideal that we share year after year, month after month, challenge after challenge. We begin to see how that works, understanding it doesn't happen automatically. It comes with a price. Jesus is reminding us of the price of our own discipleship comes at the cost of great grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his wonderful book, The Cost of Discipleship, talks about what happens when we promise that grace given to us from God comes to us, and you can just have it. It's free, and and we know that grace is the free gift of God uh, that he gives to us through Christ, but it does come to us with some obligation. He talks about cheap grace is that which is the grace that we bestow upon God ourselves cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance do you get that forgiveness without repentance is cheap it costs us something it's baptism without church discipline communion without confession cheap grace is grace without discipleship to say hey I'm going to, God's going to give us our grace but I expect nothing back from you It cheapens what he did for us on the cross. And he's saying, if you're going to follow me, I need you to follow all after me. Be my disciple. That's the ready-made context of this entire passage. What does it take to be a true disciple of Christ? And it means giving everything that we have to him that we might pursue. We may go after him hard to have the life that he wants us to have. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. It is grace without the cross. It is to believe that we can have grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Jesus did not come and live and die that we might have cheap grace. That we might count ourselves a follower of Christ and say, give me 50 cents worth of God, that's all I need. Just enough to make me feel secure, just enough to make me feel glad about a good deed here and there but not enough to make me pour over the things of God. Not enough to say, I'll give my life to the one who gave his life for me. Not enough to say that his ethic becomes my ethic. His strength becomes my strength. Where we pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. It's interesting when Jesus made that offer and made that call on multiple occasions, he got differing responses. Do you remember the rich young ruler who said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He told him. They agreed. He says, but what else? If he'd have just shut up, he'd have been safe. Be careful when you ask God, but what else do you want me to do? Because he will tell you. What else? He says, well, sell all that you have and give to the poor to which he walked away sorrowfully. And we never hear from him again. Then there was Peter. 
Jesus walked up beside the Sea of Galilee and met him, one of the least likely leaders of men that you would ever see, one of the least likely pious and spiritual souls who says, come after me, come after me. And he left everything and he followed Christ. He said, everything I've got, it's yours. 2,000 years later, we named children and we named churches and we named cities after Peter. But we never even know the rich young ruler's name. A lasting impact comes from those who are willing to give of themselves fully and wholly to God and all that God wants from us. The cost of discipleship, it draws people to the Lord. It draws, us, draws people to his gospel. We don't want to miss that. So as we begin to look at it, as we begin to go for a deep faith, it comes with a price. The deep faith means you spend time in God's word, with God's people, seeking God's leading, walking with God through the valleys. Deep faith doesn't come easy, doesn't come cheap. A life of deep impact so that when you leave this world, you can know that you have left a life that matters and honors God in all that you are and do. That carries the day. To know what that looks like individually and to know what that looks like corporately is a powerful thing. Because I tell you, I, I, I struggle and I fail just like you do. Saying, Lord, I, I want to give of myself. I, I, I want to follow. I, I want to pour my life out. I want to do that. And, but we know those moments when we get it right. We know when we get it wrong. But how about this morning as a church? Can you sit here and say with me that we dream of a time when First Baptist Church of St. Petersburg is a church that reaches far beyond its walls, not just to impact here and there and yonder, but to transform a city because of all that the people who are part of this church family pour out of themselves into the good work of the church. To imagine a room that is filled with people not for the sake of gathering a crowd. Jesus showed us here that's not the point but to fill a room with people who are following hard after Christ and seeking meaning and seeking comfort and seeking direction and strength. To be part of a church where we never have to ask ourselves, can we afford to do this? But simply, Lord, what would you have us to do? And then to move forward in faith and trust that he provides through us the resources to do that. A church full of people who are all in. Can you say all in? Can you say all in? A church that is filled with people who are all in about saying, Lord, whatever it takes, I, take my talents, use them wherever. Take my acts of service, put them to work. Take my talents, take my treasures, take, take everything that I have, and Lord, make it yours. Because discipleship costs. To be able to be a church that a huge part of what we do is not tied up in paying for things we have to pay for, but the things God wants us to do beyond ourselves, some of which we haven't even dreamed up yet. To dream of a church where every ministry is strong and resourced and carried out in every conceivable way. Because the people, not out of obligation, but out of discipleship and out of wanting to be part of something bigger than themselves, says, Lord, I'm not holding back. I am all in. Let me hear you say all in. It's hard to say all in. Amen. I like that back there. Out of the mouth of babes. Do you know why you can say all in this morning? Because long ago, on a tree, Jesus says, I'm going to give up everything I have. It's going to cost me my life cost him heaven, even cost him his place on earth. But he says, I'm all in. Because I'm about the Father's business. And when we talk about living a life of sacrifice, whether that sacrifice means our time, our talents, or our treasures, 
Even if that sacrifice means giving up our preference and our own will and way so that the kingdom can be greater served. To be able to be part of a church of folks that are, that are more concerned with pleasing than being pleased. We can't do that in our own strength. I can't and you can't. But in the strength and example of the one who did the same, we can. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It brought him to this place, and it brings us here too. The cost of discipleship is real, but so are what it brings. Don't miss that opportunity. All in? Let's pray together. Father, we come today to this table to be reminded of your sacrifice and your love. As we do in these moments, as we take this bread and we take this cup, let us be reminded, Father, that you speak into our heart and our life in so many different ways. And let each one of us ask what all in looks like for us. Let us ask, and you will tell us. And then we get to decide how we respond. Help us, Lord, to do it rightly. In your name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask our servant team to come forward, folks who are helping us in the sharing of the communion. And as we do, I'll read from Corinthians, the 11th chapter, as Paul instructs us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you not know that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. The bread of life for all of us broken. Take and eat ye all of it. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Take and drink ye all of it. The scriptures tell us that after they took the supper, that Jesus and disciples went out to the Mount of Olives. They sang a hymn together. We're going to do that this morning. 
an opportunity for us to sing a song about what we believe, what we've been a part of, to remind ourselves of the faith that we claim and the discipleship we cherish, but also to give each of us the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Some perhaps for the first time, some perhaps to come and to say, I'm all in. Whatever it is God would lead you to do, would you do that as we stand together, as we sing?